There are two things the Buddha taught us to learn how to tolerate. One is physical pain, and the other is hurtful words. And in teaching us to, look, to tolerate these things, to learn how to endure them, it's not simply a matter of gritting your teeth. You want to learn how to analyze what is it about these things that really pains the mind. And it turns out that it's not the actual sensation of the pain or the painful words. It's what the mind does with these things. That's really what makes deep inroads into the mind, which is why training the mind is such an important part. It's so necessary to the practice. It's why training the mind is actually what enables us to overcome suffering. Remember, there are two kinds of suffering. There's suffering in the three characteristics of inconstancy, stress, and not-self. That part can't be avoided. It's a necessary part of the world. And the Buddha has to reflect on that to depersonalize the suffering. Realizing that the nature of the body is such that it's leaving you open to pain all the time. All kinds of things can happen. As in John Sawat's teaching that if you don't believe that, you can take an iron spike and stick it to any part of your body, and it's going to hurt. It's just leaving you open to all kinds of attacks, disease, accidents, whatever. This is just a part of the having a body. And the same with hurtful words. He says there are basically two kinds of speech, pleasant speech and unpleasant speech, and he divides them up into different ways of being pleasant and unpleasant. There's well-meaning and ill-meaning speech, harsh and gentle, timely and untimely, true and false. And these categories of speech can be found all over the world. So when you're suffering, or when you're the person to which untimely, unkind, untrue, ill-meaning speech is directed, there's nothing really strange about that. This is part of the human condition. And John Fung had a student who was a nurse, and she was very pretty, and as a result she was the victim of a lot of jealousy from the other nurses in the hospital where she worked. And one day it was really getting to her, and she went to meditate with a John Fung who was in Bangkok at the time. And as she was meditating, she had this vision of herself in this big hall of mirrors in which reflections of herself were just heading off into infinity. A thought occurred to her she'd probably been the victim of harsh speech many times, the victim of the gossip, the gossip many, many lifetimes, and it just got even more overwhelming to her. So she went to mention this to John Fu, hoping that he would console her, say something gentle and kind and reassuring. He said, well, it's, it's your fault. You wanted to become born as a human being. This is what you get. Took her aback, but afterwards she said it really did help. This is just part of the human world. So what are you going to do? Because this is the way things are. The body leaves us open to pain, and our ears leave us open to hurtful speech. One thing is to learn how to depersonalize it, as I said, in terms of the harsh, hurtful speech. is not only that there are these types of speech the Buddha actually has you contemplate. When someone says something harsh, you just leave it at the level of the, the sound. An unpleasant sound is making contact at the ear. Most of us don't let it stop right there. We start thinking about the other person's intentions and why are they saying this and how insulted we feel or how disrespectful that other person seems. And again, that's building up a lot of suffering around the bare sensation. This is where you get into the, the suffering that's not just part of the three characteristics, it's actually part of the Four Noble Truths. This is suffering that really digs deep inside. And that's the suffering, as the Buddha said, that comes from craving and clinging. We crave for things to be a certain way, and then we cling to our notions of how they should be, and then we suffer when they're not that way. And 
And so this is where we're shooting ourselves with more arrows. The first pain is one arrow, but then we just take a whole quiver of arrows and keep shooting ourselves over the physical pain, over the harsh words. But it turns out it's those arrows with which we shoot ourselves, those are the ones that really hurt the mind. As the mind gets more still, its concentration gets stronger, its discernment gets stronger, you really begin to see that the, the physical pain doesn't have to invade the mind. We pull it in, to use another image, or we use the pain to shoot ourselves. And so part of the problem is that we're used to feeding on these things. The Buddha gives us other things to feed on. So it's not just a matter of gritting your teeth and bearing it. You learn to gain the discernment that allows you to make these distinctions. And in the meantime, you find other things to focus on. You learn how to focus on your strengths. You learn how to focus on things that are going well. You think of Buna, the monk who was going to go to a rough, uncivilized part of India. He went to say farewell to the Buddha, and the Buddha asked him, Are you ready to go to that place? The people there are said to be very uncivilized. What if they say nasty things to you? And Buddha said, Well, I'll console myself by saying, At least they're not hitting me. What if they hit you? I'll tell myself, At least they're not throwing stones at me. What if they throw stones at you? I say, At least they're not stabbing me. What if they stab you? I'll tell myself, at least they're not killing me. What if they kill you? I said, I'll tell myself, at least my death wasn't a suicide. And the Buddha said, okay, you're ready to go then. You learn how not to hurt yourself over other people's behavior. And this is one of the reasons why we also develop concentration, to give ourselves something alternative, something better to focus on. There is that ease in the body that can come from working with the breath. Even though our pains are different parts of the body, there are places in the body that you can make comfortable with the breathing. If the body were nothing but pain, you'd die. So as long as you're alive, there's some place in the body where you can focus. If not immediately easy to find, then you think of all the space around the body and the space permeating the body. It gives you an alternative object to hold in mind, and it gives you strength. It gives you a sense of ease that you can depend on, that you can use for nourishment, so you're not feeding solely on the pain. The Buddha also recommends that you develop universal goodwill. This one time when Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha and rolled a big rock down the mountain at him. And the rock ran into an obstacle and it broke into pieces. And one of the pieces went right through the Buddha's foot. And so he had this sliver of rock through his foot. So they removed the sliver. And so he lay down to rest. And the pains were really sharp. Mara came to see the Buddha and started taunting him. for being sad and miserable over his pain. The Buddha said, I'm not sad and miserable. I'm spreading goodwill to all beings. That was the Buddha's way of dealing with pain, to spread goodwill to all beings. That's how he endured the pain. It's a useful technique to use, because you're not focused on the pain. You're not focused on why me or why did that person do this to me. You're letting your mind be larger than the pain. This connects with that teaching on not suffering from your past karma by developing a limitless mind, like the water in the river. You can put a big lump of salt into the river, and as long as the river is clean, the fact that there's so much water means you can still drink the water. Not like the water in a cup. If you put that lump of salt into the water in the cup, it'd be undrinkable. So here the Buddha is giving an example of how he used this principle. He lay down in pain, but he wasn't focused on the pain. He was focused on goodwill to all beings, including the person who had rolled the rock down to begin with. He could reflect also on the fact that this was 
in some way the result of his past karma, that he was subject to this. So what the Buddha is recommending is, on the one hand, that you develop the areas in the body where there is pleasure, so you can have something to feed on aside from physical pain or the, the nasty words that are said to you, as in that book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which they recommend if you're going to draw a face, don't draw the eyes or the nose or the mouth. Draw the spaces between the eyes and the nose and the mouth, the space between the eye and the eyebrow and the space between the eyebrow and the top of the forehead. And by doing this, you're going to get a much better likeness, because you're not focusing on preconceived symbols and ideas of what an eye should look like. You're actually looking more carefully at what's really there. And so instead of the mind's normal policy of focusing immediately on the pains, you look at the area around them. You need to make that area as large and as comfortable physically through the breath, mentally through goodwill, as you can. And that way you develop the nourishment that can allow you to be patient with things, to endure things, like physical pain or unkind words, without over being overwhelmed by them and not having to suffer from them. You stop shooting yourself with the arrows that you normally shoot yourself with. It's just the one arrow of the pain. And that you find when it's just that, is a lot easier to bear. <laughs>